There is always a line that separates human beings in general. Economic status, political status, sexual orientation, to name just a few. For my case, it was social status. I lived in Kibera slums in Nairobi, Kenya. 2.5 million people live in the slum in Nairobi. Out of those, there are over 1 million people that live in Kibera slums. Kibera slum is a slum in Nairobi, Kenya, in the African continent. We used to live there, me, my three siblings, and two parents. Used to live in a very small house. Like, yes, from where the cameraman is up to the one, like nine by nine. Nine by nine house, which means it's very crowded, very mushroomed, and everything was separated by a curtain. If you want to go to the sitting room, you remove a curtain, you are in the sitting room. You want to go to the kitchen, otherwise like that. You want to go to the bathroom. Okay, where do you go to the bathroom? That was a question. So back then, this is what we used to do to go to the bathroom. You grab a plastic bag like this. It's a little bit bigger depending on your body size. So you grab a plastic bag, you take a squat, you make sure you aim it here. Then once you are done, you, you make sure you tie it really good so that it does not pour in your sitting room. Because again, where will you eat? Then you go out and you time your neighbor's rooftop. Then you're like, that neighbor or this neighbor? Then you throw it like this. It was called the flying toilet. That was a norm for so many times. So that's how we used the bathroom in Kibera slum. A line in my life I experienced one day, a Saturday afternoon. I went to, out to play. Like I mentioned, Kibera slums has 11 villages. I lived in two of them, Fortitu village and Soweto village. So this was me in Fortitu village. I went to, uh, in a field out to play. Then after some time, I was 12 years old at that time. I was raped by a 47 year old man. I was 12, he was 47. So when he lured me to that railway line, I tried talking to him. I'm like, please stop. I'm just a child. Will you please stop? He could not listen. He did what he did. The blood started housing. I was still so pretty, too timid, too female to overpower this man. So the, he did, the, the blood was oozing, my, my thighs were paining. I just got up and started walking home. Walking home from the railway line. And then I saw six other people, six other men. They looked at me and said, who you are, Kotayari? Loosely translated to, she's ready. And what clicked to my mind was like, oh, yes, they're going to do it. Seeing a old person, they're going to do it. So I just ran home. I, I walked. I, I, I walked home. And took, to, or at home, opened the door, took some salted water and, and bathed myself. And then I sat there. I didn't know what to do. I could not confide in mother. I could not confide in this foster father. So I stayed put. On Sunday came and went. Then on Monday morning, I, I went to my class teacher. The late Richard Mugu, I asked him, teacher, can you get HIV AIDS from such an ordeal? And as soon as I asked that question, he stopped what he was doing. 
I could see teachers running, carrying teachers running to the staff room, and some of them just holding me down. And after some moments, I don't know where the money came from. I was, I, I went to Shirika Clinic in 42 Village for treatment. This was on Monday at 10 a.m. The deal happened on Saturday afternoon. So I went there. After some time, the doctor was like, I have some good news and bad news. I was like, okay, what is the good news? The doctor said, the good news is that you'll not get pregnant. We've given you medication to not get pregnant. I was 12, I was menstruating, so that was a good news. The other good news is that you do not have a human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. But I do have bad news. The bad news is that you have this sexually transmitted infection that is very incurable. But you're going to manage it for the rest of your life. So I was like, okay. They give me, they give me a very rectangular look, looking like medicine that I will insert vaginally for one week to mitigate this newfound STI for the rest of my life. And doctors in the room, please find a cure. Someone might ask, how did you know that that guy was 47 years old? Well, a few days after the ordeal, I identified the man. And some women in 42 Village were like, yeah, we know the guy. He's 47. When you are bring a long kid, you have to cross some lines. A bring a long kid is a kid that is born before the parent or the adult has been married or her or bring into the marriage. So for myself, mother had me when she was not married. And then she brought me into this marriage alongside her. And yes, you guessed it. This man was alcoholic as they come. He will beat the living daylight out of me. I was thinking of wearing long sleeved, <laughs> but you can see some scars is still. It's, it's two decades later, but the scars are there all over my body because of the beatings he will beat me. But there was no food he will beat me. There was no, no rent for, for the tiny house that we lived in he will beat me, but he will not touch his golden legitimate kids. I, I'm a bring along kid, so you don't have an option. And mother was like, what do you want me to do? I already have kids in this marriage. So every time I see my academic certificates, my passport, my birth certificate holds that man's name. And everywhere I go, I tell everyone who will care to listen, please, I'm Delphine Yaboke. Do not ever call me by that surname. It's there in the certificates, but do not. It's a trigger word for me. Well, that same year, it seems the gift keeps giving. I was told by mother that I have to go to upcountry. Upcountry is where you'll, there's rural Kenya. You'll go to visit your extended relatives for, for some period. So I went. I thought it was a regular visit. But when I reached there, me and my cousins, we went through female genital mutilation. Female genital mutilation, according to UNESCO 2022 statistics, has happened to 200 million young girls and women in 31 countries in three continents in the world. Female genital mutilation has 4 million girls at risk every year because of it. And guess what? In Kenya, my country, female genital mutilation is at 15% prevalence as of 2022, statistics by UNESCO. So yes, yeah, so I went home, and this is what they will do. This is a razor blade. So they will tell me to lie down. And I have my cousin, so we'll go to the back of the house. It's tradition. I come from the Abagusi tribe. 
Abagosi tribe still do female genital mutilation and they circumcise their boys. So we go at the back of the house in Kisi Highlands, in my mother's mother, practically the grandmother, my grandmother, or not, I just call them the grandmother, went there, then we, was, we sat down. Mother, her siblings, whom I call aunts, were there cheering on to this beautiful rite of passage. I was there, I tried to scream, just sit down like this. Then there were other mother siblings that would hold me down. And then this grandmother who used the same laser blade to cut three quarters of the clitoris off. Because they said it's a rite of passage. So they'll cut one clitoris, throw it down, take ash and smear it on the fresh clitoris. Then a second person cut it, throw it, take ash, smear it like that. So that went on for some time. Then when it came to me, I tried, I tried to plead with her. I said, please, grandmother. She said, and this, if you are Bagusi, you know, Ege Sagane Eke Kimia. Loosely translated to, you uncircumcised girl, shut up. So indeed, we do. it took us five days for us to heal. When you pee, it was painful. For mothers in the house, if you remember the croning part, the, the fire, the circle of fire before croning, that's how it felt when I was pooping. Because there's no medic, they didn't give us any medicine, just one laser braid after the other. Two years later, I had rumors that mother was now trying to take this, my siblings, to Kisi Highland. I was like, oh snap, yes, here it comes. I just told her still in 42 village that mother, I will, I will go and sue you. I will go to the district education officer. I will go to police. I will, I will borrow money to go to Kisi Highland. But do not, do not make our siblings go through this. Her mother was calling her, when are the siblings, when are your children coming? And me here in Nairobi, I'm like, yes, I'll borrow money. I am, I'm, 12, I'm 14 years old at that time. I don't know what to do for money, but I will, I'll make sure there's money. So after back and forth, I am very pleased at Ex Kigali to say that my sister's genitalia are intact. So, how do you cross those lines? How do you get from a point of no one is looking at you because of where you are born, because of the circumstances around you, the circumstances around your birth, to the extent of you cannot call someone dad. I will call the man dad and he slapped me. It was resounding, so I, I stopped that name. Like, and he told me, Omoru Oche, meaning you luo person, Apparently, I'm half Luo, half uh, Bagusi. I am not your dad, right? Don't call me dad. So just foster for that to me. So how do you navigate that with the legitimate kids given everything in life to where I am today? I'll tell you three things. One, teachers in your life. Who are your teachers? Primary, secondary, university, name them. Who are your teachers? How kind are they? How approachable are they? Imagine if Mr. Richard Mugo was not approachable. I'll be a statistic. I'll fade into the background. Nobody will have, I don't know what will have become of me. But he kept pushing. He kept telling me, Dolphin, stay in school. And I stayed in school. I, it was my safe space. Whatever was happening back at home, School has always been a safe space. I'll come, I'll feel comfortable. I'll talk to lecturers and, and, and teachers there and I'll feel like, yes, it will transport me to a future. Teachers do an incredible job. I know we are more than 100 in this room, but do you know that out of every 100 people, 
58 of those people have been sexually abused. 29 being boys and 23 being girls. So it's near to us than we think. The second part, how I managed to move from those lines is for non-profit organizations, community-based organizations, companies. I'll give an example. When I was trying to do my secondary, this foster father said, yes, I don't have money for you, but he had money for these other legitimate kids, the stepsisters, you may, if you may. So I, uh, I sought refuge, and I remember Kibera Seventh-day Adventist paid for my secondary education. Those were slum dwellers like me, they did not have much, but they came together and sacrificed whatever they had. I remember shortly after that, the Good Neighbors, the Jesuits organization, they came through and paid for my diploma in electrical engineering. And then you'll ask, what about that? Well, when I was doing my bachelor's in electrical electronics engineering, I had loans, higher education loan board, leap loans, bank loans, fundraisers. I'll score straight A's. Electrical electronics engineering is a hard course. So I'll score straight A's and then I would take those traitors to a stranger. I'm like, hi, I'm Delphine. You see, I am very bright, but very poor. Will you please spare 10,000 Kenyan shillings for, to pay my school fees? Then I will repeat that story to the next person who will hear. So that is how I went through my bachelor's. And one lecturer who, who chose to remain unnamed, he, he paid for my last stretch of secondary. So teachers are very important. The last step, the three, is my quest for education. I moved, talked about teachers, non-profit, and the quest. And before I go there, I remember when I was employed by Sandy. Sandy is a software, was a software company in Kenya. When I saw, I was employed in May 2021. When I saw the compensation, I was still living in Soweto village, still in Kibera slum. The compensation took me from that slum to a fully furnished apartment. To, to an apartment that you could see a sitting room, a kitchen, a bedroom, not curtains, walls, actual walls. My son, for the first time in his life, he had his own room that he could walk, he could have his own bed. So some, some years later, I met my partner. I am very happily married to, to Haron. And I have two amazing kids. One, he's a son named Leonardo and a daughter named Chigitita. So back to the three. The, the three, my quest for education, Mr. Richard Mugoles told me, education will get me far, so stick to it. So I stuck to it. And in May 2023, 20, I received an offer from Carnegie Mellon University, Africa. MasterCard for full scholarship. I cried. I cried. I, I told my family, like, do you see this? It's MasterCard full scholarship. I do, we don't have to pay anything. My son at, was at that time nine years old. He didn't understand. My daughter was 13 months, barely. It's like, why are you guys crying? Okay. Then my partner, we had this plan of, well, my partner being a man, being a Kenyan man, sticking with a toddler, while a woman, comes to Rwanda to study. That is very hard. Relatives who were like, why you are on the man? Then he said, I am the man, but I'm also the father for the student. So I'm staying behind. I'm supporting my partner to go to school, and then we'll figure things out. So at Carnegie Mellon University, Africa, I am, I am very proud to be there. It's, it's this amazing Part that I wear many hats. I'm the current Women in Tech Club president. I am also the Women Tech Ambassadors for Kigali Rwanda. I'm also the MongoDB user group leader. I wear so many hats. Just to tell you that you can move from point A to point B if you only focus and you get and you get all the support that I've mentioned. And that's my dear audience. His how is high cross lines in the largest slum in Africa. Thank you.